said, wherever you are, there I will be. Today, as we gather in unique circumstances that the circumstances around us in this world have brought us to, that uh, we are not able to worship in community together, but I welcome all of you this morning as we come together. I thank you for, thank God for the team that is here this morning so we can bring you this live worship uh, in this time. My prayer is that you will be touched and experience the love of God in His grace.
Let us pray. Loving and caring God, we come this morning in hope. Hope that will sustain us in our trying times, our lonely times, our doubting times. Refresh us this morning with the living water of your presence and love. Open us to the possibilities of friendship, the possibilities of encountering you in unexpected ways, the possibilities of seeing the miraculous in everyday life. Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Ortonville United Methodist Church live on Facebook where we are shaping lives, sharing faith, and spreading God's love. If you are visiting here with us today, we welcome you, and we would also like to give you the opportunity to know us a little, a, a little bit better. Uh, our um, Easter services this year, uh, please join us on Palm Sunday, April 5th, and Easter Sunday, April 12th, where we will be here in the building. And you can also stay connected with us um, through our Facebook app, our mobile app, and on our website. As we continue in our praise and worship time this morning, uh, we are reminded of what Christ has done for us. And right now we are divided from him by sin, but Jesus has set us free. He is our living hope. i 
Sunday. So, well, good morning. It's good to have you here this morning. And uh, again, thanks to our team uh, here as we uh, continue on in our worship as well. And you girls, thank you. Thank you for your, God bless you, thank you for your patience, and um, as we work through this um, technology and preparations for today, I, I hope there are some out there joining us, Here's the, is there, they with us, Stacy? We got some people with us? All right, great. So, so I believe that, um, I'm not a big Facebook Live person, but I've learned a lot in the last week, and I believe that you can comment uh, as you're listening to our worship, and we're just... Glad you're with us wherever you are. The good news of today is you didn't have to do a lot to prep to be here, right? And especially if you have kids, it makes uh, that part a lot easier. So we hope that um, your time with us uh, will continue to be a blessing as well. Uh, this is a time that we normally work through our, our joys and concerns, and, and uh, we'll hear from those who have them. And so I would suggest uh, for you today, as you're listening from home or wherever you are, that... Um, you would um, feel free to, if you want to comment uh, of a prayer or a concern that you have or a joy, welcome to do that on the page itself. It's more, if it's more private, uh, you can call us here at the office and uh, we will uh, take care of that and keep you in our prayers. I did uh, as well, got a note here that um, President Trump has called for a national day of prayer uh, today. And so as we, together, in our year in worship, in a time of prayer and blessing, uh, would ask that you would continue to do that at home this day as we pray for our country, uh, for the world, and all that is going on. I thought about um, this morning as I was, well, this week as I was putting this message together, uh, a few weeks ago I did a series on anxiety, and if you go to our webpage, you can go back and hear those if you like, but... I was reminded of um, some points that I talked about in that, uh, in that series, and this idea of uh, relieving anxiety and not letting it overwhelm us, uh, because that is a place where we are, and, and even I have had to keep myself in check um, this past week, and uh, limiting my amount of watching social media, because there is a lot out there, and uh, it can be uh, helpful, but at times too much of it can have the opposite effect. So I'd encourage you just in these three ways before we go to a time of prayer to number one, just acknowledge the worthlessness of worry itself. Worry itself has no benefit. It increases our anxiety and that does not mean that we, we don't prepare and we don't uh, do safe things and, and all that is required, but worry in itself is futile, it's ineffective, and it really uh, only affects us uh, in, in, internally. And so I would encourage you to just understand that the worthlessness of worry doesn't help. Number uh, two is to turn your worries into prayers. That's what Paul taught us uh, in scriptures uh, when he said, don't be anxious about anything. Turn your worries into prayers. Present what is causing you anxiety to, uh, to God itself. And then three, to lessen your anxiety is to speak truth. Speak truth um, to, to what God has done in your past what he is doing in your present, and what he will do in your future. And uh, so I would encourage you in that way as we consider where we are at um, in the world today. Uh, we would also pray and hope, as Jenny had said, that we'll be together again on um, Palm Sunday coming up here in April, and hope that you would join us there as well. So let us go for, to a time of prayer. God of all that is living, we confess today that we have often turned from you. We have wandered in our own wilderness of fear and doubt. Our thirst mounts daily, seeking to be quenched by your redeeming love. Yet when that love is offered to us, we sometimes turn away, unable to truly believe that you would actually heal and love us. We have at times behaved in ways that are unloving and at times not measured up as we should. But God, we thank you for your forgiveness and for your grace. We thank you for your healing and for your mercy. Wash us again today as we are hearing these words from wherever we are. Help 
us to be faithful servants of your mercy poured out on us. Wash us clean and make us disciples. Help us to move from the paths of selfishness and stubbornness to the channels of hope and peace. Enable us to place our full trust in your love as we brought the, as we think of those who are near and dear to us, who are in need of your grace and your prayers. Remind us again that you also hold us dearly, and you offer to us your healing grace. Keep us strong, give us courage to serve in all that we do. And oh God, we are reminded today of those who are in need, especially those who are in fear. We pray for the vulnerable in our society who are more prone to the virus that is going around and many others that are there. God, we ask that you would provide healing where it's needed, that you would provide protection for those of us who are dear to us. We pray, oh God, too, that we would find ways to seek out and to love each other and to care for those who are in need the small things that make a big difference. And so we trust in you by your grace, O oh God, and we give all of this to you in this day. And we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they will help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God is restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again. Sure that's on and uh, we are here this is where we are and we give praise to God that we're able to communicate this way and, and uh, again thank thank you for all who are here uh, this morning to help pull this off we are in the season of Lent and it is a time that um, that is for us to reflect and to draw us uh, nearer to God uh, there are many ways that we can do that whether it's through through uh, through fasting through giving up something whether it's through a deeper sense uh, of prayer, of setting time aside to pray, uh, or to read scripture, all of it prepares us um, for what is to come as we move uh, through this Lent season uh, into the week, uh, into Holy Week, and uh, reflect, reflect more deeply on what, uh, 
God has done to us in Jesus, to, uh, through us in Jesus Christ. And so my prayer today is that you will continue to be blessed as we worship together. Well, maybe you're the kind of person who likes to get it right. I am. Everything that I do, I, I like to do well. And, and when I don't, um, I get frustrated. And maybe you found yourself in the same place. I have found that same frustration in my relationship with God as well. And so if that is the reason for the series that we are doing today, or we have been for the past couple weeks, that is stop trying to get right with God and start trying to get it right for God. And how we began a couple weeks ago is, is we looked at the problem in the garden. We went back to Genesis in the scriptures and we looked at uh, Adam and Eve and and the perfect place that God had made, and, and then when in their doubt of wanting more, they fell and sin came into the world. And it was in that place that we lost our standing to God in a sense, a relationship that was uh, once full was now broken. And so God ever since has been trying to, to restore that and get that uh, relationship back again. So that we can get right with God. I remember an elderly person that I was speaking with uh, in their last days. And, and their words to me were, I hope I have done enough. You see, oftentimes we think that our behavior can change our standing with God. When it was Jesus' perfect behavior that secured it. See, God's tell, word tells us that it's not by our goodness, but it's by grace. It's not about all the things that we do, though those are important. It's, it's by the faith that we come to in Christ Jesus, that we come to a relationship with God. I remember being a, a teenager, and I shared this at the, the opening of the series, but I remember going to my first event, and, and it was there that I gave my life to Christ more fully, and, and I went forward, and I fell on my knees, and I wept. And that moment was wonderful. But then there were the days that came where I didn't get it right, and I fell short again and again, and I tried. And so the truth is that we cannot get right with God on our own, because we are going to miss the target, probably more than we're going to hit it. When I was in uh, Boy Scouts in, in my high school days, um, we would go to camp, and often there was this um, different stations you would go to, and one of those was the archery station, and it was my least favorite, and I can, you could probably guess why, it's because I was really bad at uh, archery. I could not, for the life of me, ever hit the bullseye, and even so, I was very unlikely to ever hit the target. Well, I think too often, as, for us as Christians, is we are shooting for the wrong target some of the times. We're trying to get right with God over and over again, when really what we're talking about is getting it right for God. Really what we're talking about is coming into a relationship and growing in faith so that we can start getting it right for God. Now I want to encourage you, if you're listening at home and, and you have never made a, a commitment to, to faith in Christ, that that is where it begins. So I don't want to diminish that because it starts there. When we say yes to Jesus, because of him we get right with God. But if you've already committed to faith, whether it was a week ago or, or uh, years ago, I want to both challenge us and let us off the hook as well. That we can stop trying to get right for God because of what Jesus has done, but that we need to start getting it right for God. And so as we go through these next few moments, I encourage you to uh, open your Bibles if you're sitting at home, and, and uh, we are going to be in uh, uh, Romans, as Jenny had shared with us in the scripture reading, chapter 5, and we will walk through that here in a few moments. So. In verse 1, we learn that the Apostle Paul assures us that it is not by our goodness that this relationship with God is restored, it is by what has already been done for us. It says, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. So the question is, what has he done for us? Well, first, Jesus offered us his grace 
in himself. Verse 2, it says, Christ brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. Christ is grace. And Christ brought us to a place of, of being able to receive that grace. You see, without, without God, without faith in Christ, we are undeserving of anything. And so Jesus offered grace in himself. Second, Jesus offered uh, sacrifice. He sacrificed his place for ours. In verse 6 it says, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Christ came. That meant that Christ came from somewhere to earth when he came here as an infant. Jesus left his place of all glory and he sacrificed it for our place. And thirdly, Jesus suffered immensely for us. Verse 9 says, Since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. Jesus had to endure the cross and suffer for us. And fourthly, Jesus gave us the gift of eternal life. In verse 9, he says, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Jesus said there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus gave us the gift of eternal life, and we can have that insurance. And so the solution to the problem in the garden is found in a right relationship in the one who God sent. But getting it right for God, we can only accomplish in Jesus and chances are we're probably going to get it wrong more than we get it right, and we're probably going to miss the target more than we hit the target. But we can get it right for God in many ways. And there's a couple of thoughts I want us to consider in this passage that I think are important. Is first, we have to see ourselves for who we are without God. In Romans 5.16, it says, God's free gift leads to our being made right, with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. We have to see ourselves for who we are without God. You see, sin here is defined as missing the target, as missing the mark. Now, truth is, no one likes to be called a sinner, especially me. But the reality is, we are. And some of us, if we've been around for a few years, we know the preachers who banged on the pulpit and said, Repent! Right? Anybody experienced that, maybe? No one likes to be told they got it wrong. But we do. You know, a, a, an Olympian archer uh, hits the bullseye 70% of the time. But that is when their shots are independent of each other. When they shoot consecutively in a row, their percentage drops down to 0.85%. Interesting. Even the best miss. The truth is, we're all sinners. We all miss the target more than we hit it. But that doesn't mean we don't stop trying to get it right for God. Because when we do, life becomes more abundant. It becomes more joy-filled. And I'll get to that in a moment in our closing. The Apostle writes in verse 6, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time, and he died for us sinners. So first, we need to consider in getting right with God how we see ourselves. Now, we might think that being called utterly helpless is strong, and let me clarify that we should see ourselves as created in the image of God, as love, as created for a purpose. When I came to faith in Christ, I, I quickly learned that God had a bigger plan for me. And it had nothing to do with, I, with what I was going to do. But it had everything to do with who I put my trust in. You see, I had to see myself as a person for the person I, who I was without God so that I could draw closer to him and become more dependent on him. When I answered the call into ministry, I discovered that without Jesus, I was utterly helpless to get it right. I remember the 
first uh, appointment I had, and in, in the first month I was there, I had two funerals. And they don't train you for that stuff in seminary, believe me. And one of those was with um, a hierarchy of the church or someone who'd been there for years. And I feared that this would go well and I would do all that God would have me to do. But as I discovered and I began to put my trust in Him, I began to see myself as less powerless and less helpless. But I knew I needed God's saving grace to accomplish what He would have me do. Even Mother Teresa knew her limitations. Her quote, she says, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters and create many ripples. Corrie ten Boom, considered one of the godliest, soul-rich individuals ever, in her deep wisdom that came out of her cost of a journey through great pain in her life as her and her family helped uh, Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust. She says, if you look at the world, you'd be distressed. If you look within, you'd be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. So how do you see yourself? Do you keep trying to get it right on your own, or have you put your trust in the one who sees you differently than you see yourself? And that's the second step in getting it right for God, is knowing how God sees you. Look at verse 1 and 9. It's repeated twice here. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight. And then in verse 9, since we have been made right in God's sight. How are we made right? By the way God sees us. Not condemning. Certainly we are deserving of whatever he would have to offer, whatever his wrath, whatever you want to call it. But instead, God sees us through the prism of love. And that is why he sent the one who is love. How does a parent see a child who has done wrong? Through the eyes of grace. I remember not the day that I really, or I remember the day that I really understood fully a mother's love for her child. And it was the day that I first held our firstborn son. And if you're a loving parent, don't you view those you love differently? You see them in a unique lens, a prism that only a parent can understand that no matter what they do, you love. Sure, we encourage, we teach, we correct, but we love. So how do you see yourself? As a sinner in need of grace? Well, the good news is, is God sees us differently. God sees us as sinners redeemed. I had planned on in this series to share some testimonies with you this week and in a couple of weeks, and, and because of the way that we are gathering, I decided to postpone those for another time when we would uh, be able to do it here, uh, do it with more people present here. But I want to encourage you that um, uh, uh, Skip James, one of our uh, uh, past members here, uh, has a story of life change that is powerful. And I hope that again, that someday you will hear that story as well. And then Sandy, my wife's cousin, um, a beautiful lady who went through a trying time in her life and went to Teen Challenge to get right for God and did that. And I hope to bring you that story too. So how do we get it right or do we get it wrong? We do. But we have to focus and know on the, the deep love of the one who created us. See, it is in relationship, or as Paul says in verse 10, it is because of what Jesus has done that our friendship with God is restored. You see, God sees us differently than we see ourselves. And because of that, we can rejoice and we can bear fruit in our lives. We can get it right for God more than we don't. We can hit the target more than we miss. And so what does that righteousness look like? What is the fruit of righteousness or right living? Look at verses, these verses with me. In verse 2b, or the second half of 2, it says, We can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can walk in confidence and joyfully look forward. 
In verse 3, it says we can rejoice, too, when we run into problems. Anybody ever experienced problems and trials in your life? But we know that in Jesus, they help us to develop endurance. And this endurance develops strength of character, and this character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And then in verse 5, it says we can have this hope, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. We sang about that. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And then in verse 11, we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ who has made us a friend of God. That is the fruit of right living, the fruit of righteousness. And you may know that if you walk this journey along. And I pray that you will if you have not. So the question is, how do you see yourself? As a sinner in need of God's saving grace? You see, Jesus did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That is, get right with God. And Jesus did for us what you cannot do for yourself. So you can get right for God. Yes, we're going to miss the target more than we hit it. But because God showed us his great love... Because God sees us differently than we see ourselves, we can get right for God and we can enjoy the fruit of abundant living through a restored friendship. Again, verse 1 says we can have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ has done. Who could use a little peace in their life today? The world could use a little peace as well, as we know. How would it be to walk in confidence in this life? Sure of the next. The hope of sharing his glory. Many of you know that. What if you could rejoice in the face of problems and trials? What if you could endure through something instead of being overwhelmed by it? What if who you are, your character, was about people seeing who Jesus is? A heart filled with his love. What if hope was your compass, and Jesus your guide. Just maybe we would get it right for God more than we would get it wrong. And the good news is that God sees us differently than we see ourselves. It's not about what we do. It's about who we become. Verse 8 tells us God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die, even while we were yet sinners. But because of faith, Christ brings us into a place of undeserved privilege, and we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. So the question is, do you want that confidence today? Are you in need of some peace, some hope? The good news is, it awaits in a wonderful new relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. See, Jesus did for us what we cannot do for ourselves, that is, to get right with God. And Jesus is the way of getting it right for God. Let us pray. Lord God, we know that you hear our prayers. I pray, Lord, that those who are hearing this message today, that there may be some who need to know what it is to be right with you to come to Christ and to come to faith, to put their trust in the one who is the living hope. I pray today that this would happen for those who are listening and those who are in need, that they would know today that God sees them differently than they see themselves. I pray as well for those who have journeyed this time, whether it's long or short in their life of faith, they have found their way to be right with God in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. I pray that we would continue to be challenged to be right for God. To be all that we are called to be, to answer when we are asked and to respond. I pray, Lord, that we will continue to see the need to share your love to a hurting world. I pray this in Christ's name.
closing song is uh, Raise a Hallelujah. It's become a favorite, I think, at our church, and uh, uh, it's just an amazing um, written piece of music.
may be well with your soul. I pray that this week you will you will seek ways to encourage uh, others who are filled with anxiety to help those who are in need uh, as you can. I heard a story uh, this past week of an elderly couple who sat out in, in their car in a grocery parking lot until someone came up to them and said, can I help you get your groceries? They had fear of going in. And so maybe the challenge for us this during this time, during this time when we're not gathered together as we fully are, that we learn new ways to be the church, to be the church that God has called us to be. For we have a, a big reason to raise a hallelujah in Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.